Okay, can you hear me? Yeah. Yay, all right, thanks for coming out, and good morning. So I am from San Antonio, Texas. Uh, Bob's video yesterday had a few punches. Uh, I don't want to go into now, because I'll kind of curl up in a corner and start going into conniptions if I start rehashing that in my head, because it was full of things that weren't accurate. Imagine that, a crazy video, not accurate, correct? So skip all the, the junk here, the, the alphabet soup. Nobody cares about that. I apologize, I should have removed it. So we're going to get right into this, because the first thing you're going to want to know is who is this clown up on stage, and why at all should I even pay attention to him? So we're going to go, a couple, go through a couple things. We're going to try to bring up some red meat. We're going to try to bring up some good points that you guys can learn from, and hopefully we'll make this a real good presentation for you. So we started in San Antonio, Texas. That's me. That's my name. Okay, good stuff. Uh, we started full-time property management services in 2011. So prior to that, I did a lot of sales. I was the sales guy doing... Uh, going out selling homes, and as you kind of know, that, that wheel is like riding a bicycle. As soon as you stop pedaling and it slows down, it's going to fall over and you crash. So I wanted to look into a business that had residual, had recurrent income, and I was either insurance and or management, and I decided to go management. I'm really, really glad I'm, uh, we did that. So that's in 2011. Now we currently manage about 600 single family, 650 plus single family homes. Uh, we're roughly adding between 22 to 25 homes per month. So our business development is killing it. So we're, we're on the right track since we've only been around for five, six years. Okay, so we currently get in about 1,500 per month on each home. And a lot of this I'm talking about is gonna kind of set the stage for going through some of the good stuff. Because the first thing you wanna know again is why should I listen to them? So I'm trying to you know, set the stage for you guys to know where we're coming from. So I even equated it, 470 Australian per week for good advice from some, uh, some of your fellow Aussies. All right, and so that equates into the amount of revenue we're generating for our company. And so we're gonna go break down some of this revenue and give you some good stuff to consider. All right, so the first thing you wanna know, right, who is this guy? Uh, prior to getting into real estate, I served in the infantry in the army. I was a captain, uh, the old Saving Private Ryan stuff going on. I did that for a number of years, that's me in South Korea. Uh, ironically, it was, I was there 17 years ago. I was there when 9-11 went down. So that's a long time ago, 16 plus years ago. That's me in military school. So that's the background of me, so you kind of understand where I'm coming from. So if I'm, I'm a bit direct, uh, if I drop a few F-bombs, maybe you'll kind of understand. All right, so, whoa, time out, you lost me. Oh, here we go, all right. So I gotta go through the family stuff to completely put you to sleep, then I'll start throwing stuff at you to wake you up. So that's me and the missus, she's tall, she's like 5'10", so we're gonna have tall kids. There's the turds, Drake and Cora. They're nine and seven right now, two little kiddos. That's Disneyland. Uh, I tried to hide the rope burns around my neck because I was trying to hang myself the day before I left. I didn't really want to go. That's just, I hate Disneyland. There's the kids at Easter, you know, good looking kiddos. There's the family dog, the German short haired pointer, right? Super smart, friendly dogs. This dog gets to go to the office and she helps us sell homes. It's amazing. So it's really neat stuff. All right, talk about the fun. I do like to go fishing. I do like to go do a, I like rivers and streams. I'm not a fan of the, uh, let's go deep sea fishing where the waves are going like this and you're starting to throw up. So if anybody knows, we tried to do that in Florida and uh, it didn't quite work. So I try to stay away from that. Uh, of course, we're Dallas Cowboys fans, right? Who's for the Cowboys? Right, right. So it's not called American football, it's called football, right? You have to drop the American because we own the patent on football. I was watching rugby this morning at two in the morning because obviously I was awake, and I just, I, I don't get it. I got, someone's gonna have to explain to me how rugby works. So have pity on a, on a fellow, you know, a non-fellow, let's say, on a kind of a, a novice at the rugby game, and someone's gonna have to corner me and explain it to me. All right, so prior life, I loved to play baseball. Uh, I did that all through college and had a great time. I was a pitcher and a shortstop, and there's me hitting, and then finally, right around 40, I, I took on this very weird disease called OLD. And some of it you might know is old. I got to be old, so I said, all right, I'm gonna have to retire. So I quit doing that. Uh, I still do love to do a lot of archery stuff. So Bob said it's fine to go ahead and show pictures of what we like to do for fun. Big into archery. As you figured, Texas is so behind the times. We're still hunting dinosaurs, right? We're still tracking them down. We're putting arrows into them because we don't want them to attack our children. So that's how far behind Texas is, which fits right into your perception of what Texans are like. I like to do CrossFit, but I'm not a super crazy fit guy. I don't eat leaves and organic junk a lot. I like to eat normal stuff. 
Of course, I have a Texas Cadillac, your truck, right? You have to assume that. So you all know that I'm fairly normal there. And I love beer, right? Who loves it? Come on, Oktoberfest? You can't go wrong. All right, so that's all out of the way. We all know that uh, I'm somewhat normal, maybe not, but we can get that right out behind us. Okay, I got a quiz. I'm going to pull out the swag bag. Swag bag for the Aussie citizen test. And I'm going to have to have the MC be our referee. So you're going to have to spot who's going to be able to answer this question for me. So the, the proud winner of this question gets to take this hat home. It says, don't mess with Texas. Good stuff. All right. Which state has the most public holidays? In Australia. Queensland. Queensland. Okay. Double digit trivia time. How many holidays do they have? Because you're at least going to get the hat because you mentioned something. Victoria has 14 days. Somebody said that, right? Just nod your head and you get the hat. There you go. He got it. The guy in the blue, blue blazer right there. I got you. So you have Australian Capital Territory, 13 days. Western Australia, New South Wales, Northern Territory, 12 days. South Australia, 11 days. See? That's good trivia. So, gentleman right there next to Dan, two doors down. I got you. I got your hat. Yes, ma'am. Uh, oh, my goodness. Here we go. It's here, stomp the chump time. All right. Stop picking on me. All right, I'm a little jet lag, kind of foggy. Beat me up later. All right, what you're going to learn is to cheer up, guys. It's, it gets better, I promise. We're going to get into something decent. All right, so let's, what gets measured, what gets managed? Right, this is the, the Peter Drucker comment. We'll go through some of this. This is what this speech is about. This is what this presentation is going to be talking on. Key metrics and what they mean. So we're going to go through some of this and talk about some of the techniques. Okay? So some of the challenges. Um, this is something I'm going to propose to you. So let's say I can walk into your office with an open checkbook, pull out the wallet, and say, all right, name your price. Name your price if I walked into your office. Some of you say, forget it, get out of here, mate. You know, I'll sick the wombats on you. Some might say, hmm, that's interesting. Let's, let's see what I can figure out. But I need your most current and verifiable numbers. Think about that. Are they ready to present to me? I'm ready to write you a check for whatever you want, but you've got to present a couple things for me. And you've got to have all accounting systems and procedures need to be current. So this is going to be something where I'd have to look at it and say, okay, well, that makes sense. Think about that, because you never know when the need's going to arise when you have to sell. The D's come into play, the death, divorce, all those good stuff. That, that's, it, it can happen at any time, so be ready to sell. And this is not a, a preaching moment on that. All right, what gets measured gets managed. And what gets measured gets improved was the official quote from Peter Drucker. That's what he actually said, according to Wikipedia, is it wasn't what gets measured gets managed, it's what gets measured gets improved. But I turned it around, or as you heard from other folks, you want to manage those numbers. Not necessarily improve them because you may not have to improve it. It might be fine where it is. Attributed to Peter Drucker, and he's the founder of Modern Management. So he's been one of those guys that's been around forever, uh, taught it and all that good stuff. Okay, why are metrics so important? And you're going to love this quote. If you do not know where you come from, then you don't know where you are. And if you don't know where you are, then you don't know where you're going. And if you don't know where you're going, you are probably going wrong. That's a mouthful, right? You gotta like it though, he's wearing a cool cowboy hat. Kinda cool. Okay, this is gonna help you know where your business stands today. This is nothing new for you guys, all right? So we're gonna get to some de decent points. It gets better, I promise. Establish goals for where your business can go, identify areas of concern, and illustrate the health of your business to a buyer. That's really potentially the ultimate part of it because it may not be just a buyer gang. Let's think about this scenario. So let's say your competitor says, all right, I'm out. I'm raising the white flag. I want you to buy me out. And you have to go to a bank to get a bank loan or your cousin Guido or whomever. They're going to want to see good metrics for you so they can understand if you're going to be able to repay them. So the need may arise to possibly sell, but also to possibly buy. So if you look at it in that mindset, maybe that'll change the way you look at it, just a hair. Okay, let's talk about some of the key metrics. Most property managers track hundreds of metrics. Would you all agree? This is, this is an opportunity to make sure everybody's awake before they start throwing stuff. Uh, so everybody agree there's probably hundreds of metrics out there. And we want to break this down into five or six 
truly important metrics that are compiled out of the hundreds. Okay, five or six truly important metrics. And there's a reason for the madness on this. This is going to be your everyday measuring stick. So those five or six metrics. The key metrics, so how many doors do you manage, right? You've all heard this. And my personal metrics crusade is to get rid of that. Uh, how many times have you been at a bar and somebody bellies up to you and says, hey man, how many doors do you manage? Right? And you answer them, and it reminds me of the tape measure effect, right? I don't want to say what we're measuring, but that's what it seems like in certain instances. So I'm on a personal crusade to get rid of that because I don't want to know just what, how many homes you manage, how many units, how many doors, whatever you want to call them. I want to know several of the key things. So that's my personal crusade. It's not just about the number of doors you manage. So we'll go through some of this. So our history, our methods have been adopted out of trial and error and a lot of learning through LPMA. So there's no one way to do these things. There's not an actual, I'm not up here teaching accounting, I'm not a CPA, I'm not gonna give you the methods that are attributed to going to a bank and getting a loan. These are just things we've learned through trial and error. Chances are what we do have been copied from what you do. Because I've learned a lot from the LPMA organization. And these things are gonna be kind of brought up here. All right, so let's get better. This is a gentleman, Scott Fritz, and he wrote the 40 hour work year. And he was a keynote speaker at the NARPM conference a few years ago. Uh, NARPM, by the way, is the National Association of Residential Property Managers. It's an organization in the states, uh, a distant cousin of LPMA. Okay, so that's one of our conferences we had. He came and spoke, and this is what he said in his book. Every business has the ability to be broken down into five key metrics that will give you an immediate snapshot to quickly see if they are healthy or not. And I believe in that. I believe in that. I think we can get to about six. Now, if you want to add in 26, that's fine. 86, that's fine. But there should be some things you want to look at in particular, and we'll go through some of these. That's how you can reach out to him or see his book, uh, Growth Connect. It's a good, good audible book, by the way. Uh, I'm not much into reading, unless it's in crayon. So I like to do the audible thing so I can actually you know, hear them and understand them and then listen to them in the truck. All right, some key metrics. One, of course we track total managed units. This is nothing new. So you find this in your management software. It should be an everyday tracking mechanism for you. The key metrics, so this is ours. We track total managed units. We started with 595. We're at 620 in March. We're probably close to 640 now. So I think we might have had 10 more, so we're in that 650 range, but those are also a month behind. So two, the management fee revenue per door managed per week. You have management fee revenue per door managed per week or per month for us. And so we track that in a similar fashion. So the management fee revenue per door, our average is 128 a month, just management fees. Okay, 128 a month. So that's all the different plans that we offer. We do a three-tiered pricing model, which I went over just a hair yesterday. Uh, it's a flat fee model, which I'm a big fan of. Three-tiered flat fee pricing. And I could give a whole other presentation on that and why it works. But let's just kind of stick to this point. So the next part, total revenue per door managed per week or per month. Total revenue. This is where you start getting into the sundries type stuff. Okay? So total management fee revenue, we're in a 227 range, $227 per month. So if you really want to break that down, you can. Uh, you can break it down per week, but you can see there's about $100 of sundry revenue going on top of the management fee revenue. So we've fee maxed, and Darren, I'm gonna give you some props. That's a big part of what you helped us do in the States. So thank you, Darren, I'll punch you in the arm later. You're welcome. Okay, so um, from one January, the total board percentage could add an additional tracking mechanism. All right, so total growth percentage. Total growth percentage, I'm just tracking year to date. And right now we're up 7% from the start of the year. So that's a 7.08% up. And that's one of the things I'm wanting to track because you can kind of tell if you're doing this by just that one little metric. If you have growth, net growth now, this is net growth. If you have growth, that's a good sign, correct? If that's a negative figure, you know, timeout. Ooh, we lost 7% and it's only just past the first quarter. Might be panic time, okay? That's a really key metric for me. I want to know that I'm growing. So I can take one snapshot of that and feel better. Okay, percentage of total company staff expense to revenue, including business development. So how much is your staffing going to cost you? 
All right, this is what we have. We're right at, call it 50% for an average, 51%. So essentially you have your revenue and your staffing expenses below that. The gauge from NARPM, some inside info here that's not gonna be up here, the gauge from NARPM is between 45 to 55% staffing. So I've talked to some PMs over here and they say that might even be high because they were talking 30, 40 range, which is really cool but we're in that 50% range, and I, th I feel that's really the top end. That's, that's kind of where you want to end up being. Now, it's not gonna, you don't, don't kill me if, you know, if you're at 60%, don't corner me and say I'm wrong, because there's all, there are gonna be exceptions. It should be potentially a little higher if you're in super growth mode, because you may have learned this here, you can be in either super growth mode, or you can be in profit mode. Which one are you in, super growth or profit mode? You can't have both. Okay, so you have to keep that in mind. All right, and then our profit margin percentage, your EBITDA. I don't want to get into that too much because it gets a little deep. But right now we're hurting. We're hurting. So I have a good story to tell. I'll give you some dirty laundry. I, guess, I figured you guys like stories, right? Uh, Bob was telling me that. Go ahead and tell them your, your worst stories and they'll dig it. So minus 25% in February. Ouch. Where did that come from? This is, you know, real numbers. I didn't want to sugarcoat it. So years ago, three years ago, I had a bad relationship with a business development manager, a horrible contract, right? So we got into it. It was completely set up wrong. It was my mistake, my rookie mistake, let's say, because this was really about year two we were cooking. You know, we were, we were kind of getting the BDM going. I took the advice of LPMA. I set up a business development manager, and I paid him wrong. The compensation structure, structure was wrong. And... Years later, we started to blow up. I mean, his compensation went from here to like astronomical, and I went to renegotiate that with him. It didn't go well. So basically, that's a settlement. That's a settlement charge. I had to write him a check for a large amount, come straight out of the profit margin, and that was a one-time check. So getting past that, we have a better situation now with our staffing for business development because we're, we're spending a lot less, but I thought I'd at least tell you that story because I'm not perfect just like you are. Maybe the point of that is if you have a bad business development relationship or a bad employee relationship, sometimes you have to you know, take the punch in the face and move on. Okay, slides. These are gonna be courtesy of Alex Osinenko, who's also a vendor here. And so we're gonna talk some profitability ratios from some of the stuff he's given me. So he's got, let me go back, he's from 4.5.com. So he's got a booth here, so check out Alex. He's the raging Russian over there. So you probably want to check him out, go to see what he's doing. They do a lot of social media stuff. Uh, it's hard for me to describe what he does, but you're just gonna have to go talk to him. So I got these slides from him. And so the customer's acquisition cost is something that he preaches. You have your sales and marketing cost divided by your units under management could be a CAC, your customer acquisition cost. That could be a critical point to remember. Okay, because you want to understand that on a deeper level. So take mental note of this, your customer acquisition cost, your annual customer value, your lifetime customer value. Has anybody heard of this? I'm sure you have. So you take your total sales under units, units under management, you have your annual customer value. And I'll go through some of the numbers that we have so you kind of put the math to your head. And so you break that down and that could be your annual customer value per year. That's what each client, each management company, excuse me, each manager, let me say it again, each owner, each landlord, could be worth that much per year. We're very close. Lifetime customer value. And you can figure, you take, the, the variable that you're gonna have to remember is how long is your lifetime customer? I mean, how long are they staying with your organization? That's something you have to figure out. So the math is fairly easy. You have your, your annual customer value, how much per year. Take that times how many months or years, if you wanna do that, that they're gonna stay in your business. It gives you a lifetime customer value. Okay, that's important, that's important. So we have the CAC, ACV, LCV, each broken down. All right, so we're gonna go through that in real time uh, scenario here. All right, I do have a question for you guys. All right, I'm gonna have to wipe the sweat here. I'm saying it with a smile. You guys ready for this? <laughs> Why did the property manager hire the marsupial? Because he was qualified. <laughs> Come on. Come on. 
So now you're awake and you really hate me. This is good. This is good. All right, pay attention now. Otherwise it gets worse. I'll, I'll break out more jokes. All right, the customer acquisition costs as we were talking could be the ceiling. What should be the ceiling, let's say? What should be the max that you should spend to acquire a customer? I think you all are doing that in your head. What should my max be? What is my customer acquisition cost? It's not necessarily an easy thing to figure. Uh, I was talking to a gent yesterday evening in the bar, um, and he did buy me a beer, by the way, so I'm going to have to find him. I've got a T-shirt for him. But the point of this is it gets a little gray when you start talking about sales, what's, you know, what's coming from sales and what's coming from management. And then you may have several people in your office doing a hybrid of both. So it gets a little gray, okay? But if we go to the top end and you track these things, it's going to give you at least a ceiling to stay under. Okay, let's go through that. Here's the formula. Your lifetime customer value, multiply it by 20%. So it's, let's say it's $10,000 or 11, whatever you want to figure, times 0 0.20, and that should give you a figure for that. And where did I get this? From Built to Sell, John Warlow. Uh, he's got an awesome podcast out there, Built to Sell. Talks all about selling companies. And that may not be in your radar, but darn it, if you can prepare yourself now to sell, it makes you that much better every day because you know you're confidently doing things right. And that's really a key point. So why multiply by 20%? According to his book, customer acquisition costs should be no more than five times the amount of the customer lifetime value. It almost equates to a profit margin. If you're looking for an X profit margin, let's say a 20% profit margin, it almost equates to that, but it's not really the root of that. And that's from John Wardle, Built to Sell, as I mentioned. Good book, better podcast, because they talk about real world interviews. Uh, they've interviewed several people that have sold companies from a quarter million, you know, a couple hundred thousand, to like 180 million, all the way up. It's really fascinating because the numbers start to come out in those types of podcasts. So good opportunity to learn something there. Okay, what should be the ceiling for our CAC, our customer acquisition cost? Define your lifetime customer value. So if we take ours, right? So we take our total revenue per door times 12. So we have 227 times 12 equals that much, right? That's going to get us to determine your lifetime value of three and a half years. All right, going fine fast. That's just what we, we guessed. So we got three and a half years. Now you can dig this out of your software, but it, it's a little bit more difficult. At least it is in ours. So we use kind of an industry standard, and I'm using air quotes, industry standard, because we really don't know 100% what the industry standard is, so we're using a three and a half years. And maybe that's inaccurate, right? Maybe that is for you guys, but that's what we're using for our figure. So determine your lifetime customer value, take that amount times three and a half years, so we're at 9,500 for a lifetime customer value. Okay, so it goes into what's gonna be our lifetime uh, our, our ceiling. So the lifetime customer value is that times 20% times 0 0.20 and that's going to give us our cap. So if we can keep our customer acquisition cost under $1,900 we should be, all, should be all good. Would you agree? Disagree? Is it a, is it a magic figure in, in line of sand? Not necessarily. But at least it's got something to give you as where should I limit it? So you're not spending too much on Google Ads. You're not overspending on purchasing somebody else's business. You're not overspending to gain that customer. At least gives you some sort of resemblance of a ceiling. All right. This is a famous quote from Abraham Lincoln, the 14th president of the United States. Whoever spends the most on Google AdWords wins. Did you know Abraham Lincoln said that? Okay. I think they went right over the heads. I'm gonna, I'll start throwing stuff if you need me to. The higher your lifetime customer value is, the more you could pay. Would you agree? If your customer lifetime value was 20 grand, because you know they're going to stay with you for eight or 10 years, could you justify paying more, 3,000, 4,000 to gain that customer? I mean, think about it. You're still winning in the end. All right, the net promoter score. This could be a whole other presentation on this stuff, but I do want to talk about this as an important metric. So is your team tracking a net promoter score? Have we heard kind of the buzz around the industry of what the NPS is? I know it's been somewhat popular over here. Can I get a yes, no, or? Okay, something, all right, good. So the net promoter score has been a prevalent type of thing that's kind of sneaking into the industry. And it's one question, really. How likely is that you would recommend an organization to a friend or colleague? 
So in my experience, in my recommendations, of course we track that. We've got you know, that amount of NPS scores for the last new lease move-ins, right? That's one of them. But here's some of the best practices. We record those responses in SurveyMonkey. Okay, the spreadsheets are okay, but SurveyMonkey gives you all kinds of different ways to analyze that data with percentages, with numbers, metrics. So I'd recommend using SurveyMonkey. Uh, the online surveys have low success. So when I start talking surveys, I don't necessarily say send out a blast email to your tenants to just annoy the heck out of them or to your owners because eventually they get, that stuff becomes like white noise. Would you agree? We get so many emails a day that you start to see an email from your management company and it's not important, like your house is on fire, eh, whatever. They're just another, another promotional email. So what we do is we recommend you call, right? So choose a key time to call for those maintenance, call for your leasing, call for the owners. Find somebody to call in your office. Don't give them an opportunity to say, do you have time to talk? Basically ask them one question. Bam! You know, would you recommend this to your family and friends? And see what they gauge. And then record that into SurveyMonkey, because you're only going to put in two or three questions. Okay? Call them. You got to call them. You have to. Okay. Customer reach by staff. You call results recorded in SurveyMonkey. So if you didn't catch that, we call them, and we put those results inside of SurveyMonkey so we can record those. Right, the simple spreadsheets get lost, they get, you know, whatever. I just, I'm really, really excited about what we're doing there. And we outsource that. So to get on a different topic, it's not necessarily my staff members that are calling when a maintenance work order is completed. We outsource that. Okay, we have a crew that we uh, have hired, they answer our phones, they do that. In between answering phone calls, they're making outbound phone calls. The key one I really like is the maintenance one. We call out on the maintenance work orders being completed. So if a tradie, right, I got a term, tradie, tradie comes back and says, okay, we've done what you're supposed to send us to do. How do you really know that they did that? And how do you know the tenant was happy with it? So if you survey the tenant with a quick phone call, you're going to know if your trades person showed up, did the right thing, and completed the job, and if the tenant is happy with it in a survey call, okay? Now, if you want to build that into your maintenance team and they want to call, that's fine because that's a, that's a happy point. It can be a happy point. I mean, let's say you responded to a maintenance call within three hours and you got over there and fixed everything, and now that person is super happy. Well, why not ask for a Google review? Why not ask for a, uh, do you have Yelp over here? Do you have Yelp? I'm sorry. I hate Yelp. But why not ask for one of those reviews? That's a great opportunity. You find those, those key points that are happy times. Okay, our ratio of sundry revenue in relation to management fee revenue. Boy, you guys are going to hate me. You're going to hate me. Right, Darren? Pay attention. That's right. You guys are going to hate me because we have our non-management fee revenue and our management fee revenues are amazing because we can charge fees and not get lynched. Uh, I think you guys are a little bit different there. So our management fee revenue, right at 77 cents. So for every dollar of management fee revenue, we're getting 77 cents in sundries. And that's non-leasing, okay? That's, that's not the leasing side of it. We charge a leasing commission. This is just, I don't know if I can, can I name fees without getting tackled? I mean, it's gonna be late fees, it's gonna be risk mitigation fees, it's gonna be admin fees, it's gonna be uh, eviction fees, NSF fees. I mean, it just goes on and on and on. So that's one nice thing we have in the States that you guys, don't have is we can charge fees. So a gentleman and I were talking here in the front row. Uh, he attended my speech yesterday and he didn't understand or didn't realize that uh, the penetration in the states, the market penetration is right around 20, 30 percent. So the owners that manage our own homes, the management companies are only getting about 30 percent of that business. So think of that, 70, maybe 80 percent of those landlords out there are running around doing it themselves. Scary thought. But that doesn't make it for a great industry sometimes versus you guys here, and a gentleman was in South Australia, right in Adelaide, he says they're talking about a 90% penetration into that market. 90% of the landlords use a management company. What a great opportunity you guys have here. I mean, that's phenomenal. So kudos to you, I really wish we had that. Uh, in the states right now, you know, there's, there's two states, by the way. There's Texas and then there's outside of Texas. So the west coast of Texas, California, uh, they're talking about bringing more and more regulation to the state of Texas. And everything they do ends up creeping east, unfortunately. So we're going to eventually start to see 
more regulation. Uh, a term I had that kind of blew people away yesterday on evictions, it's notice of gunpoint 30 days. <laughs> right? Right? People are like, what? Yeah, it's, it's really crazy. So you post a notice, uh, you file the eviction, you go to court, you file the writ of possession, you go with the sheriff, and the sheriff says, hey, Bubba, get out. Sidewalk party time. Could be 30 to 45 days. Very quick process. Very landlord friendly. Okay, sundry revenue items. Some of these you can and cannot do. Renewal fees, leasing fees, late fees, application fees, animal fees, and risk mitigation fees. Uh, animal fees, I don't think you can do. Is that correct? No, yeah. So that's a, that's a, that's a big bummer because you're missing out. I can tell you some numbers of what we did with animals last year, but it might make you cry. All right, multiple property owners. This is a key point to kind of see the health of your business. All right, so our largest multiple property owner, we have 36 MPOs. And if you caught my presentation yesterday, you know that we designed a management agreement specifically for the multiple property owner. So the person that has four or more units, they get flat fee pricing, all the bells and whistles, all the guarantees, uh, the cancellation policies are waived. I mean, everything's kind of put into their favor. So we're getting a lot more interest from investors because we're a full disclosure company. So kind of pay attention to that. If you want to do the it depends model of pricing, that's fine. I just think that today's industry, today's consumer wants you to disclose what you're going to charge up front. So you get those phone calls. Now, I know the sales technique. I know, okay, you want the phone call. You want to be able to sell them. You want to be able to close for the appointment. You want to show up to their door with your shirt tucked in on time and say, okay, great, here I am. Look at me. I understand that. But to get to that point, to get those phone calls, the industry, the consumer, is leaning towards the full disclosure mindset. If you don't show them what you're doing, they're just going to go away and find somebody else that is. Okay? So the NPL. So we have 36 of them, only 5% is our percentage of multiple property owners. So it's very healthy in my opinion. And then we have our largest owner only has 2%. So why is that critical? We'll go through that. Okay, so percentage of multiple property owners, investors, the higher the percentage, the healthier the business. Would you agree? If you had more multiple property owners in your business, that makes your business a bit more healthier because it means they're investors, right? It's not the reluctant landlord, just not the overly emotional owners that had their kids raised there for 10 years and they just can't disconnect it from their, from their brain, right? So the, the more investors you have from a multiple property owner program, the more of these you can draw in. And on the flip side, the percentage of portfolio to the largest MPO, the lower the percentage, the healthier your business. And what I mean is our largest MPO has 13 homes, only 2% of the business. How is that significant? Well, if he had 40% of our business and then we got cross, he's leaving. Imagine losing 40% of your business in a 30-day cycle. That's a big kick to the you-know-where. So definitely uh, keep that in mind as you're tracking your metrics. Okay, I got another one. Who's ready? I have some more swag to give out. More swag if you're paying attention. Okay. Whoever can somewhat answer this gets a Texas hat with a Texas flag and don't mess with Texas on the back. These are super cool. She's shaking her head. She knows. She wants that. Okay, here you guys go. You ready? What kind of music do kangaroos listen to? Who said it? You got it. That's my man right there. I got you, brother. Hip hop. <laughs> Come on. I know it. That's stupid, but... Come on, you gotta like, you know, have, a, have some fun with this. You can't have fun, what, what are you doing here? Okay, prepare to sell, as we talked about. Seek out and conduct a health check. I know Bob does a pretty good health check. Uh, I know there's some other vendors that do that type of stuff. I think that's a great thing to do for your business, conduct a health check. But if nothing else, do a peer health check. Have you thought of doing this? Do you have a sister company in Adelaide from when you live in Perth and you guys start to say, hey man, why don't we do like a health check on each other? Right? Why don't we compare numbers and then we talk some mastermind stuff going on here? That's a good idea, right? Okay, ensure financial books are in order. Duh, right? Pay attention. Make sure your books are in order. Review those twice a year. So one of the comments I made yesterday about the books, I recommend that you use an outsourced bookkeeper. Okay, you can use an insource, uh, you know, a lady in your office, 30, 40, 50-year-old gentleman in your office, 
30, 40, 50,000 a year, I recommend to take that to an outsourced place in your local market. Find one of those people that will do your books for 55, 60, 65 bucks an hour, but they crank it out really fast. So we've been doing that. We spend about 18,000 a year in fees on outsourced bookkeeping. They do all the reconciliations, handle all the stuff, present all the documents, make all the forms right. I mean, they do everything there where it's just a data dump to my CPA, my, my accountant, okay? Where I say that, here's the cool part, is it gives you another check and balance. Can you feel me there? Can you imagine the bookkeeper like doing some weird things with the books and nobody's paying attention to where the money just kind of, you know, goes into cyberspace somewhere and nobody catches it? If you have an outsourced bookkeeper, they're going to catch some of those red flags and present them to you. So one more benefit. Uh, I like the local outsourcing. All right, ensure that the five, six metrics are important for your business are readily available. So the ones that we talked about, uh, I, I keep a spreadsheet. It's two pages long, and we go through that monthly. My GM compiles all the numbers from all the different places because it's not just it's not your software. It's going to be your books. It's going to be five different places. You know, you have to compile that, that information and put it into your spreadsheets. Okay, I've got a good one that if you want, you know, we'll talk about it. But I think that's going to give you a real good way to track it. Increase your total revenue do per door by 10%. So that's a challenge, right? Figure out a way to increase your revenue by 10% this year. I hear some crickets, right? Start to, start to wonder, right, how am I going to do that? Well, I don't know. Figure it out. That's a challenge. You guys got the hip-hop question. You can do anything. Implement one new fee this year. So that's a challenge for you. One new fee. Maybe your fee maxed already. Maybe it could be raising your leasing fee by X percent. Figure out a way to do that. There's got to be something for you. Okay, and subscribe to our podcast show. So I host a podcast in the States. It's called the Property Management Mastermind Show. And you can find it on the website, Property Management Mastermind. And what it is is basically we are doing interviews. And I'm the host, so we're just talking with other property managers, other vendors in the industry, talking about different things, putting on a show, talking about mastermind stuff. So it's really from your angle, right? It's, it's from, I'm the property management company owner, just like some of you out there, and we're just doing a mastermind show and putting it in, into a voice recording, right? So actually, there's some really good red meat in there, so I recommend you take a listen. Uh, if you're interested further in some of the stuff we talked about with uh, the products that we have or the, uh, the spreadsheets that we have or some of the forms we do, uh, we have a website called propertymanagerproductions.com. Uh, myself, and you may have met Kevin Knight from last year. He was here at the LPMA conference. We put some of our best stuff on there onto the Property Management Productions website. So it's going to be a data dump, uh, automated Dropbox link. It's going to last about five, uh, get five downloads. And so the price of that is $3.99 Australian. Okay? So if you're interested in that, I think there's over 150 files in there. Uh, I had several Aussies take a look at it and they said, yeah, mate, that's great. You know, that's awesome. So, moving on from there. My calls for assistance. Please find us and review us online. If you review us, I'll reciprocate. Okay? If you haven't figured out the reviews game yet, now's your chance. All right, I'm going to give you a little secret. A lot of the reviews out there are not actually customers. Right? Is that a, is that a mind-blowing statement? You're having your friends review you, your family review you, uh, you're getting Yelp reviews from wherever. Those things are not always true actual experiences from your business. But go on there or find us on Google, find us on Yelp and say, hey, he did not drop any F-bombs through the entire speech. Five stars. Right? That's good. I, I had to resist that. Okay. Uh, subscribe to our podcast show. Go into iTunes and leave us a five-star review. That would really help us. Okay? That would be great if you could do that for me. And check out our products at Property Management Productions. So we may have a few questions to do. Uh, we may have some time to do some questions. So I'm a hard-of-hearing guy, and you guys speak funny, so you're going to have to really yell out and ask your questions. Otherwise, it's mic drop time. Drop the mic and run. Who's like that? Okay, questions. Anyone? Yes, ma'am. What your risk management fee? What what is entailed in that? In which case, your risk management fee? Uh, your risk mitigation fee. Oh, your the risk mitigation fee. Do you really want to know? Okay. Uh, I don't know if you can charge that here in, in Australia, but I will tell you what it is. So we have credit scores, and the risk mitigation fee 
compiles itself or, or ties itself into a credit score. So, for example, if you have a credit score from 620 to 600, we charge you a $250 risk mitigation fee because you really need a 620 in the States to buy a home, to get a loan. And then if you're scaled down from 599 to 550, we charge you 750 as a risk mitigation fee. If you're 500 to a 549, we can charge 1250, $1,250 for risk mitigation fee. And they pay it gladly because at the end of the day, they're in the home for less, they're not getting stuck with a double or triple deposit, and those fees come to us because we turn around and give our owners guarantees. That's how we justify it to the owners, right? So we offer our owners free guarantees for animal fees, uh, destruction of the home, that type of thing. It's all in writing. It's all on our website. This is not, I'm, just, I'm not shooting this from the hip. But essentially what we're doing is we're charging that risk or offsetting that risk to a potentially risky tenant. Because we get tenants from, uh, you know, I'm in South San Antonio, or South Texas, San Antonio. We do get tenants that come in with no credit score. You know, imagine the foreign nationals that have no credit. So we don't really know what they're going to do, so we do charge them a slight risk mitigation fee instead of a double or triple deposit, which we could do. So the cost of renting the home, the cost of renting the home is lower. Okay? You guys follow me? A couple things we've done with the fees. So in the states, you know, there's two states, there's Texas and everybody else. In the states that we are, uh, we are starting to do more animal fees in a different function, different fashion. So the animal fees, for example, were as high as $250, $300, $400 per animal, right? Uh, And those are going to be straight money to the house. But that creates a large burden of expense for the tenants coming in. Okay, sometimes you have to turn it around and say, all right, Mr. Tenant, uh, instead of you bringing $3,000 to the table to get into this home, we're only going to make you bring $2,200. And if you can advertise that fact, you may get more applications, you may get more tenants looking to rent from you because you don't charge the types of fees that other management companies do. Okay, that's one of the points of difference we created. I always say create more points of difference and figure out a way to make those. So did I answer that question good enough? That's a whole other tangent. And again, you guys probably may not understand all that, how we can do it legally and not get you know, lynched, but we can. That's what our market calls for. And so you might have heard of a term called pet rent. Is that becoming more prevalent at all? Anywhere has even heard some, something like that, pet rent? Do you guys do that over here? Yes, Darren? No? Okay. Okay, so no tenant fees. That's, I may have to sit down and think about that for a second. How does that work? We have the tenant listed as a protected species. Right, we talked about that. Darren is my, my translator, so I appreciate that. Okay, any other questions? Let me go back a little bit for you. A 7% figure? Yeah. yeah, that's year to date net. net. Yeah, that's a net growth. Because we also take into account what we're losing. And I track three different things as far as losses. We have your, your bad losses. You can imagine you get cross with an owner and you tell them, you know, go away. Your neutral losses could be your referrals, could be your owners moving back in. Or your bad losses could be, you know, or excuse me, we start with bad, or your good losses are going to be your sales, right? If you close that management cycle up with selling that home, that's a good loss. You know? And so you always want to make sure you're getting those sales somehow, either getting a full or doing those sales in-house. Right? Okay. Hopefully I answered that. Yes, ma'am. Uh, I'm sorry. Please repeat. Oh, KPIs for property management tasks. No. I think you can, but you're, you're getting a little bit, to me, we want to keep it simple in the office. I know managers that have KPIs this darn long for every single task that's getting done. I don't see the problem in that. However, we're not that advanced. I want to look at the big pictures. So you might be talking the management, fi- the management functions at a lower level to make those tasks go. You can put those into your metrics all day long. Okay? So remember we talked about just a second ago, you can track hundreds of different metrics. That's going to be one that you may track that we may not. 
but I would recommend you at least break it down to five or six key metrics that you can take a snapshot of the business monthly or weekly and look at what you're doing. And it is a net growth figure. That 7% you saw, that's what we've added. I think we've done, uh, we've added 91 homes to date this year, probably 95 by this point. That's what we've done since the 1st of January. That's how many management agreements we've signed up. So it's cooking. It's cooking nicely right along in San Antonio. Okay, any other questions? Yes, sir. We have two business development people, and we used to have one, and I did the Australian model. Uh, that worked out well. We called him a business development manager. Then we switched it up to do an inside and an outside person. So the inside person is your, your marketing guru. They answer the phone. They do the Facebook. They do the, uh, some of the phone work. You know, all the stuff you would do on the inside. Uh, the mar uh, just, just you start thinking of what they, what they need to do. They set up the outside person for success. So inside, outside approach. The business development officer on the outside they're the ones going out to the appointments. They're going to see the homes, and they're going to have their schedule run by the inside person. So the two-headed monster approach, I really like because it's redundant. So if one person is gone, then the other person can fill in. You're not losing out. Because we've seen months where the business development person was gone, and the numbers just drop. You might get six or eight less signups because the business development person was gone that month. You know, even for something for a week or two for vacation. I really like the two-headed approach. And uh, I can talk to you more about that later on if you want. Yes? Organic growth. Is your business be all organic growth? All organic growth, correct. Uh, I talk about that more in the next presentation at 1.30. These are all kitchen table growth. These are all onesies, twosies. This is not like, you know, we, we bought 200 homes one day and we're all of a sudden triple the size. Uh, we've never acquired any homes. Do you sell your properties? We do. We do sell our own properties. Uh, that's one of my uh, things I always like to hone in on or express is control the sale somehow. You can refer it, that's fine. Just don't let them go to somebody they met in church or somebody they met in a grocery store that's a realtor, and now you lose the deal because they're going to go use somebody else. That's a maddening experience. You'd have to agree with me. When they call you up and say, yeah, I met this lady at church, and she's going to sell her home, goodbye. You know, they want out of their contract or they're going to take it back from you. Maddening experience. Always control the sale if you can. Do it in-house. Uh, we even cut them a break on the commissions. So in the management agreement, we indicate that our commission is a hair lower. I don't know if I can mention numbers, but let's just say you have your normal commission, and we have ours in the management agreement. So a lot of times we say up front, we charge less of a commission up front. And then we do the sales in-house. Okay, I don't do that any longer. The, the staff does it, so they have all those sales. Uh, if you give staff sales... Take a hefty split. 50-50, in my opinion, is not enough. We go 30-70, and they're happy to get it. Because it's the amount of work they do, where that business came from, and look at the total amount of that commission. So we go down to even a 30-70 split. So if I give you business, you get 30, I get 70. Right? And they're, they love it all day long. They're not going to walk away from it because where did they get it? You handed it to them on a silver platter. Okay, any other questions? Sir? Talking about hiring staff, what sort of salaries do you pay? How do you work out remuneration? And are there any benefits on top of salary? Good question. So we have salary structures throughout. The big one that we like to talk about, which I learned through the Australians, through LPMA, through Andrew Reese, was we revenue share with our portfolio managers. We pay 20% of the revenue to that particular property manager, to that portfolio manager. Um, and so there's some revenues there. There's a few sundries that they get a part of. And right now, we have four portfolio managers. So you have Ruby, you have uh, Eric Cannon, you have Maureen, you have Melanie. So Ruby's at 175 homes and makes roughly 70000 a year from the revenue share. And so the way we did it, it was a door A or door B. A door A was a 24000 a year, like a base salary. So if you hire somebody with no homes, give them a, a base salary just to survive. But once they get past that, they get into the revenue share of door B, then they're going to support themselves. So it's not the both, it's not 24 grand plus, it's going to be one or the other, so you have to keep them alive. The rest are just going to be an hourly or salary, there's really no, I mean just that conversation may not correlate to what we're doing here, because I can start talking numbers, but you guys are going to just in one year out the other, because they don't really necessarily mean anything in your market. But on the revenue share side, the 20% is what we do. Uh, I, I'm really a big firm believer in that, because one, if you put that into a portfolio manager's lap, Anytime they get a home, they get excited. Would you agree? Anytime they lose a home, they get irritated, potentially. 
So you make it hurt for them a little bit. And it ended up being about $40 a month to those portfolio managers for every home they had or they lost. So it's a good chunk, right? It's a good chunk of money. So they started to like really take stock and taking care of their owners, making sure the renewals are done because they get paid a renewal portion of that renewal fee. So those things have really benefited us in keeping track of all those homes. Okay, so let's end it now if we can. I appreciate your time here. And if you have any questions, feel free to grab me in the hall. And I, thanks again for letting me come and, and present to you. It's been a great time.